Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me and especially Aggie. As you heard, my title is Emerging Strategies for the Immunotherapy of Pancreatic Cancer. I do have to um, uh, tell you about the following financial relationships. Um, I will be discussing the investigational use of GVAX and Listeria monocytogenes expressing mesothelin. Both are licensed to Aduro Biotech and I have the potential to receive royalties in the future. So um, it's a really great time to be in immunotherapy for cancer. Um, you know, in our field, we say cancer immunotherapy has finally come of age. And so for one, the FDA has approved the first um, vaccine for prostate cancer, and this targets a tumor-specific antigen that's expressed by prostate cancers. The FDA also approved the first checkpoint inhib inhibitor, ipilimumab. Now, these are um, signals on T cells that are down-regulated, so inhibit the T cell once they get to the tumor microenvironment. So an antibody to this is able to activate the T cell, and this was FDA approved for melanoma. The PD-1, PD-L1 pathway, another checkpoint inhibitory pathway on T cells, is showing efficacy in a number of solid tumors for the first time, including lung and renal cell. And the FDA did approve the first PD-1 blocking antibody um, called paralizumab for ipilimumab resistant melanoma. So um, immune checkpoint blocking agents are really the game changers in our field. They're the ones that are really showing the major activity right now. These immune checkpoint agents act on T cells. So here's the issue. The issue is that only a minority of the tumors have natural T cells. So what that means is that 50% of melanomas, typically, if you look at them, they have natural uh, T cells infiltrating their tumors, about 20% of renal cells, and about 10 to 20% of lung or colorectal cancers. But for most cancers, immune modulation alone is not going to be enough. And even for some of these patients who do have T cells infiltrating, it's not even enough. So a T cell generating agent is likely going to be needed. So the big um, purpose of this talk is to really try to provide you with some insights into how to get an effective T cell into the tumor and then get it activated. So here's um, single agent vaccine immune checkpoints um, are not enough. Uh, for immunologic cancers. We still have lots of room for improvement. And this comes from the fact that these are the two key studies. This was the phase three study that approved the prostate cancer vaccine. And you can see it's really just a small improvement over no treatment at all in metastatic disease. Even when you look at the first checkpoint inhibitor, ipilimumab, which you see here is ipilimumab either alone or with um, a very weak uh, melanoma vaccine, GP100, versus the vaccine alone. So again, a small improvement. The important point, though, about these immune checkpoint inhibitors is this tail here. So what we're finding is that patients who do respond, and I'll show you some good examples of that in pancreatic cancer, those who do respond tend to go on for a long time. We're talking about years, and these are metastatic patients. So that is the good news about these agents. So here's why melanoma um, seems to respond to single agent. When you look at a number of melanomas, mostly 50% of them, this is the melanoma itself with the um, brown melanin staining. These are the T cells infiltrating. This is high power. Here you have your T cells and you have your tumor. What you see is these T cells coming in around the tumor. They're not infiltrating the tumor because they're being halted. They're inactive once they get in. So this explains why immune checkpoint inhibitors that can now activate those T cells work well in cancers that do have um, this T cell infiltration. But here's the problem. These, these immune checkpoints act on T cells. And so the main goal of this type of immunotherapy is to raise an army of T cells to attack the tumor. And what you're looking at here are the tumor cells, and this is a T cell coming into the tumor microenvironment. Many cancers do not naturally induce the T cells. Vaccines turn out to be the best igniters um, or inducers of T cells. But once they get in, what happens is they get in and they're halted just like in melanoma. So you still need immune modulating agents to unleash the full potential of these ignited T cells. So how do we do this for every tumor? So the first thing is we need to understand the many different signals within the tumor microenvironment that inhibit effective T cell trafficking and function into the tumor. And so this is a 
picture of all of what we've been learning over the past 10 years, and it's really been just the past 10 years because with um, the new molecular technologies that have been available, we can now also be able to dissect the signals on T cells and on the cells that interact with T cells to figure out how best a T cell is activated and regulated. And so what you see here are the two you've heard a lot about, CTLA-4 and PD-1. These are signals on the T cell that interact with ligands um, on a either tumor cell or a dendritic cell. And for those of you not immunologists, dendritic cells I like to think of as the conductor of the immune response where they really, they're not just activators or suppressors, they're really regulators of immune response and they're, most, they're the most efficient regulators of immune response. And so as a prototype, CTLA-4 is an example where this is an inhibitory signal on the T cell, but it also has an activating co-receptor called CD28. And under conditions of a viral infection, CTLA-4 is really non-existent. It's CD28 interacting with the signal here on a T cell or on a dendritic cell. And so what happens is you get activation of the T cell. However, in the case of autoimmunity, um, where you don't want an activated T cell, CTLA-4 plays um, the big role interacting with the same signal. So this is pretty much how many of these um, regulatory signals work. And so you've heard about these two. There are two more now that are in phase one testing uh, that you'll hear about soon. Lag three, an antibody to LAG3 also provides um, an inhibitory signal to T cells and also TIM3, which is inhibitory. Now, there's not just inhibitory signals, there's also activating signals on T cells. So um, you've probably heard a little bit about some of these signals like CD40 ligand on a T cell, which interacts with CD40. There's an antibody to that in the clinics. OX40 is about to be in the clinics or is just in phase one testing, as well as CD137 or 41BB. So these are the ones we know of so far. I expect that we're gonna learn many more in the near future. What's important is that these biologic roles are not redundant. And this is very important. This is why we need to understand the tumor microenvironment for each tumor type. And there's probably differential upregulation by different tumor types. And in fact, this, we're, we're really early in the field because we don't even know if there's different um, regulation depending on different patients with the same cancer or different stages of the disease. So we're seeing some really good successes, but I think we're just at the beginning of those successes right now. So again, the key points for this part of the talk are these new immune checkpoint agents act on T cells. Only a minority of tumors have natural T cells, and those are the ones that are responding to single agents, those th uh, three or four that I just listed. For most cancers, immune modulation will not be enough. We still need a T cell um, activating agent to go along with it. And again, different cancers may have different checkpoint pathways that predominate. Okay, so. Um, the next part of the talk is to point out that combinations are needed to achieve the full potential of the immune system to recognize and kill cancers. In order to do this, we need to understand all the signaling networks that regulate immune responses to the different cancers. We also need to know what are the right combinations for each cancer and also what sequence you want to give it in. When do some of these signals come up versus when others come up? We also need to selectively control cancer-specific T cells because the main side effect we're learning is autoimmunity. And so now that we've been able to really activate the immune system, we are seeing that other side of the coin. And so we need to be able to regulate the T cells that cause autoimmunity versus the T cells that cause anti-cancer responses. So overall, it's really not an all or none phenomenon, but it's really a balance. And the balance currently has favored uh, a pro-carcinogenic tumor inflammation in the tumor microenvironment, but there's also a number of factors that can help to alter that balance. And so the balance, although it favors carcinogenesis, we're now, with all these new advances, we're beginning to be able to tip that balance and hopefully move more and more in favor of an anti-cancer response. Okay, so what makes an immunologically quiescent tumor, and that's pancreatic cancer, um, different from immunologically active cancers like melanoma um, that respond to immunotherapy. Well, this is pancreatic cancer, and we did hear that there are some people who are doing well, and again, that, that tail here, there's a few, you know, five to seven percent that still survive long term. But hopefully we're going to make a bigger difference in that over the next um, couple of years. So this is what a pancreatic cancer typically looks at when you look at the inflammation in it um, when it comes out at the time of surgery. And so what you're seeing here is typically tumor islands of tumor cells. 
Okay, and then you see this dense stromal reaction. So unlike the melanoma where you see effector T cells coming in, we don't see those. What we see instead are regulatory cells, such as FOXP3 T regulatory cells that inhibit the effectors. Also monocytes, you've heard of MDSCs. There are a number of different monocytes that are known to suppress T cell responses that sit in the tumor. So and these are the many signals that a number of groups have now identified that are found in the pancreatic tumor microenvironment. And so the tumor itself has a number of signals, including STAT3. It has these growth factor signals that can also interact with inflammation, where we um, have a paper in press showing that GAL3 is uniquely expressed by pancreatic cancers and suppresses T cells in the microenvironment. Here's your activated T cell, which gets downregulated by regulatory T cells that come in, by tumor-associated macrophages, by dendritic cells that are pro-carcinogenic rather than anti-cancer. And then also there are many stromal factors that help to recruit this inflammation that's pro-carcinogenic. So we're really starting to learn a lot. It's a complex field, but um, we're, we're starting to be able to elucidate the many mechanisms. And pancreatic cancer happens to be one of the cancers that's leading the field in this area because of the great mouse models that are now available for this disease. And so, um, the next part of my talk is hopefully going to conv convince you that even in cancers like pancreatic cancer, the immune system can be provoked. And so this is a study that was reported by Bob Von der Heide and uh, Greg Beatty and their colleagues at University of Pennsylvania. Um, this was in 2011, and they did a, a phase one study of 10 patients that received uh, gemcitabine plus the CD40 agonist, so it activates monocytes and therefore activates T cells. And what they showed was that you can actually get regressions. This is baseline where you can see tumors in the liver. And by the third cycle of therapy, they saw regressions in a good number of those patients. So again, for the first time, it, showing that CD40 can act on monocytes to cause regression in pancreatic cancer. We've been working on a vaccine approach, and this is a dendritic cell activating vaccine approach. It's comprised of two whole cell tumor vaccines genetically modified to express granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. It's given under the skin, and it recruits by secreting GMCSF, it recruits those dendritic cells and also activates them. So they're going to activate a T cell response rather than suppress it. What's nice about this approach is it allows the dendritic cell to determine what in the pancreatic cancer is most important for the immune system to react against. Uh, once the dendritic cell takes up those antigens, it tra uh, traffics to lymph nodes where it primes both a CD4 and a CD8 um, effector T cell response, which can then circulate to the tumor. But as I mentioned, there are a number of factors that then halt their ability to actually uh, eradicate the tumor, one of which are T regulatory cells, and we've been working showing that low doses of cyclophosphamide can deplete those, and I'll show you that in the next study. And so this was a study that was uh, recently reported in cancer immuno immunology research um, done by myself and colleagues, uh, Lei Zhang and Dan Leheru in medical oncology, Barish Edel and also Chris Wolfgang in surgery, and then Eric Lutz, who's a immunologist with us. And this was a unique study at the time because it tested the vaccine two weeks before the patients underwent surgical resection of their cancer. And so here it is, uh, two weeks before they get our allogeneic vaccine, then they undergo surgery for uh, hopeful, hopefully a cure. And uh, then they go on to our typical protocol in, in adjuvant where they get a second vaccine integrated with adjuvant chemo radiation, then four more vaccines every month, and then they go on to a um, long-term uh, boosting protocol if they're still disease free. And uh, there were three arms to this study. Patients either got vaccine alone, they got low dose psi with the vaccine, um, intravenously one time dose at the time of the vaccine to deplete Tregs, or metronomic psi, which is oral psi given daily um, uh, starting with uh, each vaccination for two weeks. So you saw the picture where you see only um, when, you, when you resect a pancreatic cancer that has not gotten any therapy uh, that's immune-based where it's mostly suppressive inflammation. Well, this is a totally different picture. These are lymph nodes coming into the pancreatic cancer, lymphoid aggregates. And you can see them coming around, but they also infiltrate the tumor. 
We saw this in 85% of the patients, and we've done 60 patients now, although we reported on the first 39 patients. And so when you start to look at it both um, with H&E and also immunohistochemistry, what you see is they look exactly like a uh, germinal center. They have CD20, B cells in the middle. They have T cells around the end. And then they stain for a germinal center-like structure, CD21. So they're actively functioning, acti actively forming. They're Ki67 positive, so they're actively proliferating. And when we look at them a little bit further, what you see um, are other evidence that um, they are uh, bringing in activate, activated um, dendritic cells and monocytes, DC lamp and CD83, means these are dendritic cells that will activate a T cell. Same thing with CD68 and CD163 associated um, with monocytes that will activate a T cell. And uh, just to show you that these are actively developing, uh, they express both a lymphatic vessel marker showing that new uh, vessels are being formed. And then they also express CCL21, which is a chemokine involved in lymphoid neogenesis. So again, so very important to show that these are actively developing. So what's important here is that just because they get in, that doesn't mean the patient is going to have a uh, anti-cancer response. What we're finding, and I'll show you, is that these are really sites of regulation. They're bringing the T cells in, they're activating them, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily fully um, functional. And so how do I know that? Well, first of all, the T cells are uh, partially antigen experience, that's CD45RA, versus naive, so they're coming in, hopefully getting experienced with antigen. They um, express a T cell uh, marker that helps them traffic into the tumor, CXCR3. They express um, CD69 and CD4. TBET is a T helper one, so a CD4 activation um, transcription factor. Very minimal FOXP3, so less T regulatory cells. But they don't express granzyme B. And granzyme B is one of the effector molecules used to lyse a tumor. So again, we believe they're regulating. They're not necessarily um, effectors as of yet. And then when you start to look at some of the checkpoint um, uh, inhibitors uh, or signaling pathways within these lymphoid aggregates, what we find is that, in fact, um, when you don't have um, any lymphocytes infiltrating, you don't see any PD-1 or pd one So you'd think that that's not involved in pancreatic cancer. But as soon as you get T cells coming in, all of a sudden that pd one goes up on the monocytes in the lymphoid aggregates. Okay, this is um, an anti pd one antibody. But it also goes up on the tumor. This is adjacent tumor. Now, most of the studies so far have suggested that it's the tumor, at least in melanoma, that's important. Nobody's really even begun to look at what's happening and what it means to have it on the monocytes in something like a lymphoid aggregate. So again, pancreatic cancer may be different than melanoma. We need to further follow up. And then PD-1, its ligand is up on the T cells. Now, this is expected because if you think about what's happening, so when you don't have any inflammation in an organ, a normal organ or a cancer, you're not going to have these signals that inhibit activation. But as soon as these lymphocytes come in, what the pancreas is saying, forget about the tumor, the pancreas is saying, I don't want autoimmunity. So it's upregulating the typical pathways that would really be there to prevent autoimmunity. And so I would hypothesize that what we really need to do next is come in with an antibody to inhibit this signal so the cancer can be eradicated. So, and when we start to look at patients who have done well versus patients who haven't, so what this is looking at now is over, overall survival, um, this is less than, I believe this is, yeah, less than 1.5 versus greater than three years. This is looking at the number of FOXP3 cells, so those are the regulatory T cells. So if they're high, patients didn't do as well. Now, looking at the ratio of effector cells to the ratio of the regulatory cells, those patients who live greater than three years do a lot better. So it's, it's again, it's not an all or none, it's getting that ratio to alter. that. We can do um, microdissection. You see here before dissection, after, and we could start to look at the gene um, signatures that are associated with those patients who do well versus those who don't to help us better understand what we want to do in the tumor microenvironment to make it better. And so what you're seeing here is um, the white bars are the best ones to look at. That's survival um, benefits. So patients who have a good survival benefit, they have low Tregs. What was surprising was in these lymphoid aggregates, they have a high T helper 17, which is often associated with autoimmunity. 
And then they have a mixed bag when it comes to the two types of CD4 effector cells. Um, and again, looking at PDL1, it doesn't matter. PDL1 is going to be upregulated because it's not an inhibitory signal in and of itself. It's really a sign of T cell activation, antigen experience, and sometimes exhaustion. It's only when it interacts with PDL1, which you see is down in patients who do well, that's when you get the inhibition of the T cell. And so then the other thing to know is that the patients who did well on this study, who went out three or more years, they had CD8 effector T cells infiltrating out of those lymphoid aggregates. So that's what you're seeing here now. And so this is looking at both CD4 and CD8 T cell effector cells, and the patients were vaccinated who did well. They had higher numbers, um, as you see here, and they're making interferon gamma, which is the cytokine that tells us they're activated. And then again, this is just looking at um, the T effector to Fox P3 ratio, and again, it's elevated in patients who are vaccinated who did well. And just looking that IL-17 is not only, we had, a, we had a really due diligence and show that truly is expressed, and it's an important um, effector cytokine to look for in a patient who's going to do well in the lymphoid aggregates. You could see here patients who survive greater than three years have a fair bit of uh, expression. Um, as opposed to less than 1.5 years, and you could actually see the expression along with its transcription factor, ROR gamma C. And so um, the next thing, I don't like to usually show anecdotal studies, but this is showing one of our first patients who finished up the study and went on to boosting. And just to show you, we are changing the tumor microenvironment. Um, he was our first subject. He had all his vaccines and then went on to boosting every six months. He received his first boost without problems. He returned for a second boost, and now at two and a half years since his diagnosis, he feels great. He's a runner as well, like the patient we heard about, had been really sick when he first presented. But we get a CAT scan before each um, immunization every six months at this point. Um, and basically what the CAT scan showed was a new lesion in the part of the pancreas we left in in the tail. And, you know, the surgeon said, this is cancer. It looked like cancer. But we did get a PET scan. So you could see here's the CT scan um, over here, the tumor, um, or presumed tumor. And, but it was very PET avid, more than you'd expect with a pancreatic cancer. And inflammation is typically PET avid. And sure enough, so he went to surgery, had it resected, not one tumor cell. He never had any symptoms, but what this looks like, this chronic inflammation, when you stain it, it's all activated macrophages coming in to clean up something. This is the cleanup crew. So that's all we saw. So this patient, still, he's five years out, doing great, you know, running, having fun, feeling great. And he gets his boosts every six months. So, um, so new advances are beginning to tip that balance um, in favor of a potent anti-tumor immune response. But how do we further tip the balance? You know, giving vaccines alone we know is not going to be enough. I showed you that in many of these patients we upregulate those signals that say, hey, no autoimmunity. Well, we want to give the vaccine um, to induce a, an expanded T cell repertoire, but we also want to give it with immune modulating agents. And so, I'm go so basically, um, Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, as I mentioned to you, the problem is they come in, they're making gamma interferon, and that is the cytokine that upregulates the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway, and that's the problem. Um, it also upregulates other pathways like CTLA-4. So I am going to show you um, evidence from a pilot study uh, supporting the need for combining a T-cell activating vaccine with T-cell modulating agents for this disease. And this was done by my colleague, Young Lee, at Johns Hopkins. And she conducted a study in patients who failed two or more chemotherapies, metastatic disease, really nothing left to offer these patients. And she compared ipilimumab alone. So this was our first combination study that we had going. And she compared ipilimumab alone at a high dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram, which was approved for melanoma, uh, versus the combination, our vaccine, the two allolines lines plus ipilimumab. And it was given every, th the treatments were given every three weeks for induction times four, and then every three months until uh, patients showed progression. And basically, again, um, these are the allogeneic cell lines, or two cell lines that these patients received. And so what you see here, um, is the survival curves. This is ipilimumab alone, and this is the combination. But again, what's important is that tail, 
and that tail has gone out over two years for many of the patients. The 12-month overall survival was 27% in the combo versus only 7% in the IPI alone associated with T-cell responses. Importantly, for the first time, we're seeing regressions on CAT scan in these patients who have failed two or more chemotherapies baseline. Now, this is the key with these agents, these immune agents. They take a while to show radiographic evidence of regressions. So at week seven, almost two months, you see progression, but the patient felt good. By week 14, you see it starts to regress, and this patient went on to a partial response and over two years survival. Here is that um, one of the patients, again showing in this case that the CA99 biomarker, which is um, a measure of the burden of the disease, um, actually changes with um, the treatment as well. This was a patient who got his treatments, the four arrows, and then he got one of the side effects, hypophysitis. We had to give him steroids. His CA99 starts going up. As soon as you take him off steroids, it came off, and he went on without any more treatment to have a normalization of CA99 without progression for um, almost two years. And uh, this is another patient who remained on study over a year and a half where you could see the four different uh, treatments. As soon as um, his CA99 went up, more treatment comes down. You could see that with treatment, the tumor burden is coming down. So just an example of that, you know, these patients are really responding to these agents. So what's on the horizon? New vaccine approaches that may do a better job of inducing T cells, and I'm just going to show you one or two more slides of our Listeria monocytogenous vaccine targeting uh, mesothelin, an antigen we had found uh, important as a rejection antigen in pancreatic cancer. There are other vaccines being tested as well, and I think on the horizon you'll be seeing coming along are vaccines that are patient-specific, targeting mutations within the cancer. Um, combinations of immune check checkpoint inhibitors with vaccines, and uh, we have a current study that's following up with the CTLA-4 GVAX and metastatic disease. We also have a study that is about to launch anti-PD-1 with um, our new vaccine approach, a GVAX prime, a Listeria boost. There are other studies combining multiple immune activating agents at once with methylation targeting agents. Methylation, um, by hypomethylating, you're uncovering cytokines in the tumor microenvironment that may be anti-cancer or may upregulate antigens for which the immune system may be attracted. So this is very interesting as well. And then, of course, you've heard about the engineered T cells, the CARs that target um, uh, lymphoma. Well, they're also now being tested targeting pancreatic cancer. And so just two more slides showing you that um, two vaccines may be better than one. This is our GVAX. I told you how that worked. Well, we're also combining it with a listeria, um, which is a bacteria that targets the dendritic cell. It's intracellular. It has a natural way of releasing the antigen. We've modified it um, so that it deletes two uh, areas that are virulent. Um, it's expressing mesothelin. And we found in animal models that giving GVAX first to prime and listeria to boost is the best way to give it to get the best response. And again, the benefits of this vaccine are one, it's very safe. We've tested it in multiple patients in phase one without any problems whatsoever. It also has no antibiotic resistant genes, very sensitive to penicillin should anything happen. Um, it expresses mesothelin. We can put any gene in there. It's a cassette, so it's very easy to modify. And importantly, because it's a bacteria, it acts like a natural adjuvant as well, so it helps to expand or propagate uh, an activated T cell response. And so, um, again, Young Lee and um, our colleagues at Hopkins compared um, uh, Psi GVAX, so um, with uh, this uh, Listeria vaccine versus just GVAX alone, and they got six immunizations uh, on either arm. These were patients who were either um, second or third line. This is looking at all comers. You could see it was significant um, improvement in survival uh, of the combination, prime boost, and what's nice is the tail, again, goes out over a year. What's even more impressive was third line, um, pretty significant, and again, uh, tail going out more than um, a year. And this correlated with a change, those patients who did well correlated with a change in um, the uh, biomarker. We didn't see regressions that met criteria for, um, resist criteria for partial responses, but we did see CA99 changes without progression. So the final point then is that we are making improvements in this disease. 
Um, these are patients who don't get therapy. These are patients who get standard chemotherapy. Checkpoint blockade in some cancers are improving that, particularly ones that have T cells, but most patients are going to need combinations to really make the big effect. And I'll stop there. Thank you.